Hello. Uh, welcome everybody to the PRI forum number three about the category digital musics and sound arts. Um, I'm sitting here with our like three winners, Jana Winderen, who won the Golden Nike, Philip Czech, who won one of the two distinctions, and Apostolos Lufopoulos, who won the other one. And everybody will, um, in a second, present their, uh, their work. Uh, I was on a jury together with Mike Harding, who is here, also Markus Boffer is here, uh, Isabel Bodoni, Isabella Bodoni and Ludger Brümmer uh, cannot be here today, but yeah, we five, we made the jury. jury. And I wanted to uh, tell you in, at the beginning a little bit about the uh, yeah, variety of the entries and, and everything, and then give the stage to our winners. So in the uh, category Digital Music and Sound Arts, there were 717 entries. Um, and it was, again, I have already been in the jury the last year, and again, it was like a really huge var variety of different works. So we had like pieces of electroacoustic music, sound installations, uh, then a lot of works based on field recordings um, in different presentation forms. People also handed in the concepts for musical instruments or, yeah, already built musical instruments, but also like concepts for music platforms, sonifications were also a subject, so like a really huge variety of works. Um, there were some major themes one could see this year, um, and one major theme was the exploration of our acoustic environment, so really like significantly number of artists were concerned with that, um, to raise the awareness for how fragile the nature is. Um, also, noise pollution was a subject, uh, and the question how noise pollution affects uh, yeah, our nature, the other creatures with which we are sharing this world. And Jana Winderen, who won the Golden Nike, is very much working in this field, so yes, you will see in a minute. Um, Another topic was, in general, the work with space. Um, also then, there were, as I already mentioned, some concepts of musical platforms, um, network projects, which uh, also used the sound and music uh, to raise social and political questions. Um, yeah, so that were like the main topics. Uh, in general, uh, we can say, I think, uh, and this, this yeah, uh, also is the reason, I think, for this like, huge variety of works that sound is becoming, uh, in our society, um, more and more bigger role. Uh, it's like slowly becoming an integral part of like, every field of, of our life. Uh, you can see that, that, for example, every machine has its own sound design, um, but what I actually found out recently, um, what also is like starting now because I broke my hands recently and I was like then searching for a program which is um, uh, yeah, like this speech to text program and when I did like a little bit of research what's there around, I found out that this will be the next thing that uh, we will start to, uh, to, to, to um, how you call, to maneuver our machines with voice. So they are really heavily working on this. So yeah, you can see that sound and music is becoming uh, a bigger or playing a, a bigger and bigger role. And in front of this uh, background, I think we can say that uh, what was also significant that dig digitalization is like everywhere, um, but it's not a subject by itself anymore. So um, yeah, it's, it's not interesting to underline that something was made digitally. Almost in every musical process there is some digitalization involved. Uh, and yeah, this was also uh, interesting to see. And we will see this, for example, uh, also in the two distinctions, because here are like digital processes um, involved, but yeah, very much in the background. And for example, Philip Czech, he will then present us his work, and he will he's like working with like very old technology actually. 
but nevertheless, uh, the digitalization plays a role, but like this combination and really organic flowing into each other of different um, technologies is also something which was very significant. Yeah, with this like a uh, few words about the general jury process and, and, and works, I would like to give the stage to Jana. Uh, Jana Got, Jana Winderen got the uh, Golden Nike for her CD. Uh, do you have it here? Energy Field, which came out on Touch. And uh, yeah, we were all very impressed with this work. Um, and I would like to mention a few uh, reasons why we uh, thought that this work should get the Golden Nike. It's like, yeah, for a lot of reasons, but uh, as you will see, for the love, for the detail, um, like also yesterday I did a long interview with Jana and it was very beautiful when you were explaining how you were like searching or you are searching for these very small little sounds and we will hear that uh, in a minute. Um, but also, yeah, what uh, is very impressive is like the consequence with which uh, Jana follows her interests in these like little sounds. Um, I don't want to tell more now because it's <laughs> then not yeah. so interesting maybe, uh, or like it's more exciting if I don't say what kind of little sounds. Um, but also like the way uh, how this CD is built. There are like three pieces on this CD which actually um, follow a narration, which, uh, which follow a storyline and uh, also like the way how the, how the story is built uh, is was also something which yeah very much impressed us and with these words i give the word over to you yeah thank you and uh, first of all i will thank the jury and ars electronica for the prize and the trust in my work i haven't had the opportunity to say that yet thank <laughs> Okay, yes, there's my website. So yeah, um, my background is really from within both science and, um, and visual art. And since many years, since already 93, I've been working with immaterial material uh, in my work. I didn't want to contribute anymore to large objects and filling up the world with more rubbish. <laughs> Um, so, um, and just to say, the energy field, I was invited by Touch to, uh, to, um, to do, and it took me uh, three years. At that point, I had been to uh, Greenland, and uh, I was, uh, the reason why I went there was really to, um, to listen in to the icebergs that are moving. <laughs> and uh, a friend of mine had just been there and was telling me about this, and I thought, okay. I called and got a ticket, and I went there. Um, a reason to do a CD, I've been working with, um, with um, installations for many years. Uh, with interactive installations and uh, with other uh, types of, um, of formats. But uh, it was a new thing to me then to think in time of a beginning and an end. And in this way, I've been thinking energy feel more like a story, like you mentioned, uh, that it starts on land with the sound of dogs and ravens. And, uh, you know, there's more dogs in Greenland than there is... Uh, then there is people, and in the summertime they're waiting for work in the winter, so they stand around howling, so it's a sort of a distinct sound that you have there. But more like, you know, for me it's very important with the place and not just taking the, the sounds from the internet or from an archive, because it's not that much then about the sound, but also about the place and the people I meet, you know, and the story they tell me, stories they tell me. Um, so I will just start by playing you uh, the little the in beginning of the CD. Just get you into the mood of the cold. 
it's very warm here for me, actually, <laughs> the last couple of days. As you hear this uh, raven here, I just have to tell you the story, even if I don't have much time. Because I was standing looking up on the, on the, lamp, on the lamp post, and there was this raven sitting looking down at me. And it was making dog sounds. I was like, what? Is this really possible? And it's like looking back at it, and really it was quite close, and he was howling like those dogs you heard. And then when I was starting to think more about it afterwards, it's like, of course, this raven has learned that if it howls like dogs, humans like myself comes with, with meat. You know. so, you know, this kind of experiences I wouldn't get on the internet or in, in a sound archive. Um, well, I travel on my own uh, mainly because it's a very concentrated, um, thing to do. I mean, I need to be able to concentrate over a long time and be quite sort of focused. So the reason why there is an image that I actually put the camera on my own, overlooking Kangia, which is um, now a World Heritage Site uh, in Greenland. The large icebergs are, are um, um, breaking off of the inland ice and then going out. Do you see all this sort of like building? You know, it, it's like blocks and blocks of houses the size of this. And the sounds are accordingly large. No. Down there you can see <coughs> my equipment I use, or some of it, <laughs> which is these uh, hydrophones here. They are um, based on the same principle as a contact microphone, as a piezo. So they are Vib you know, they pick up vibrations, very small vibrations in the material they are attached to. So um, there are various, so these are um, constantly kind of moving up the, <laughs> you know, these are more, much, much more, ex um, both more expensive and more sensitive, uh, that I can pick up even little insect sounds. Because, you know, one of my main interests is really to pick out what we cannot sense as an obvious, or even uh, frequencies that lies above our hearing ability and, and at places we can't get to. And there is a huge, of course, a huge landscape of, um, of sound underwater that we are not very much aware of, and that our fish are using it. Um, not only whales that we know are communicating with sound, even with no kind of fraction of how they use sound. Fish is also using sound. Some crustaceans, like a type of shrimp, is using sound as a weapon. 
and um, to stun its prey with. You know, it makes this little bubble with its claw, it bursts and it stuns its prey. Its prey. And sound is very, very important for, um, for the creatures in the ocean to orient themselves with. No. Well, I just I briefly go, there's another story. <laughs> Which, if you see there, the, my equipment is right down by this, um, by this, uh, by the ice itself. And um, when I was down there, I had this feeling it was quite dangerous. I was sort of shaking a bit, and it's like, Shit, this is like, you know, but it was so exciting because the sounds was beautiful down there, you know, the crackling of 10,000 year old ice that are breaking up. It's so condensed, that's why it's very different from a one year old ice. Uh, though when I had been down there and I walked up the hill again, it was this sign <laughs> saying, do not enter extreme life danger, you know, and I felt a bit stupid, you know, not really taking enough care and understanding that if one of these icebergs were shifting, you know, they melt more underneath than they do on the top and you get these huge tsunamis, you know, and I wouldn't be standing here if that happened and it happened you know, just a few days after I was there. So I won't do that again. But this is, I guess, how you learn, you know, sort of, yeah. Uh, I want to play you the sound of this when the ice is crackling and melting. I put the hydrophones right inside the ice itself. coming to the concert, you will hear more of this later on today. Uh, you mentioned sound pollution, and in Greenland even, and all places I've been, and you know, both in the south and the north, and all over the planet, sound pollution is a problem. And uh, here, even the first time I was there, it was a midnight sun, so the fishermen were out uh, the whole time. So I had to find the gap around sort of five, or uh, six o'clock in the morning to go out and record to not get the sound of the motor because, of course, the fish sounds, they're quite low in decibel. They're not really loud. So they get totally overpowered by a motor. I will play you an example of fish sound. This is uh, Sai, we call it in Norwegian. It's a Norwegian Pollock. Oh, oh wait a minute. Um, that is using the sound when it's hunting, and I recorded it off a Norwegian fjord when they were coming in with the tide to hunt the smaller fish. Because you can recognize the grunt, you know, this is a uh, typical uh, sai grunt. <laughs> and um, a cod has a different sound, a haddock is very distinctively different again. Um, and I have a sound here, which actually also appears on energy field. And this is the sound of snails as they are feeding. 
underwater. And even you see there's sea urchins there. They have a more you know a mechanical sound, but I can hear it's produced by them when they are filtrating the water. You have this kind of rhythmic uh, sucking, sucking sounds. But I don't really have time to go through everything here. So, and this is the perfect uh, recording conditions. You see the water is totally flat and it's quite rare that you get that. So I'm often out in smaller boats or sometimes also in uh, larger boats. This is uh, the Marine Institute's uh, boat um, that I was uh, joining both in relation to this project and the project I do together with Chris Watson, which is called Voices from the Deep, where we're following the migration of cods into the Norwegian coast. And I wanted to really know more about cods, you know, how do they actually make the sound? How do they, um, how do they hear? And how they make the sound is that they use a swim bladder, and especially when they are about to mate, these uh, muscles are growing, and they have this, yeah, the six drum muscles that they uh, make this grunt with. And um, they have a really beautiful mating sound. There's this long rumble that they make when they are going up in this couple together, uh, when they actually do the mating. And the females, they are actually choosing the males according to sound and not size. And I like that. It's a hypothesis, though, but uh, I like it. <laughs> So here you see there is um, a marine biologist uh, from Bergen Marine Institute uh, that are look. Actually, what they're doing there is that they're looking into the ear otoliths uh, of the cod ear because you can look. They're quite small, but you can look at them in the microscope, and they have ear rings, so you can actually see how old it is. And they are collecting material like this, and I've done it for years to monitor the Barents Sea ecosystem. And it's, though <laughs> I, I learned a lot from them being there, and since I have a background in organic chemistry and chemistry, fish ecology, we could also communicate very well. Um, though um, a disaster happened there for me because I brought my, at that point, these hydrophones here. They are quite small and, you know, this is quite thin wire and I didn't have a big kind of mesh around it or anything like they had for their equipment. And the BBC were going to do a live uh, interview with me from the boat. And, you know, obviously I had to have the, to hear the sounds, to send the sounds to them. I lowered the hydrophones down and, you know, as you saw the ship is quite large, <laughs> and the waves out there are huge, you know, and it's dark, and it's quite terrible. And the wave just crashed my equipment up against the side of the, <laughs> of the boat, and I didn't get the sounds to send over to BBC. So I'm not sure how much time i got left now. Eight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always worry that I get over because I, there's so much I could tell you. But I'm happy to answer questions if you approach me <laughs> out there afterwards. Um, yeah, then I want to say a little bit about how I work with the actual CD and the composition. For me, the composition starts very much out there in the field. You know, I'm listening into the sounds, as I said, in a very concentrated way and following the sound, going closer to it, and also talking to local people, where is the fish, you know, where is the, you know, where is this type of fish, what kind of fish is here, and so on, and so on. Uh, but then I bring the material back, and I, there's a lot of work. I mean, it took me three years to make this CD, you know. Uh, there's a lot of tidying up that needs to be done. It's not just to, 
I'm not just using the recordings as they are. So I always work in like three levels, where I have first the, the atmosphere of the place, you know, this whole kind of the open space, this. Uh, and then another, the second level where I'm going closer to the habitat of the area, you know, so I could describe slightly more, and then the detailed um, sounds that will be more like the individual fish or, or uh, you know, this more kind of higher mid-range frequencies. And that layer I very often leave very much as it is, though it needs to be tidied and, you know, arranged. Um, but though I also use processing in terms of putting on, uh, no, in terms of cutting out the high frequency, for example, for the level that I am putting underneath as a bed where the uh, sound is lying on top of. So this is how, can I, how I'm thinking in terms of composition. Though I don't have a musical background, I'm from the visual art, as I said in, in the introduction. Uh, I also think it's more in, in terms of the CD, like a story with a beginning and an end. Uh, and, and it also needs then to have a dramaturgic, uh, so it's interesting to keep listening to it. I mean, the listening process is, of course, also then uh, important uh, to keep your attention. <laughs> Uh, and this is also, I think, I feel the case when you do a concert that you need to have some kind of development. Though there are different ways of working, also, you know, can, and there's, it's a very different thing to do. It. The time issue is important on the kind of when I ask you to sit down and listen and not just come in and choose your own time as you will do in an installation. And I will sneak in. A last sound here for you. I'm working at the moment on on uh, back swimmers and um, water boatmen for a project where um, I'm listening into pollution. I won't start talking too much about that, but but I will for the end. I will just now play you the sound of this little creature, which is actually the creature that makes the most sound according to its size. And this is a freshwater, underwater insect. Okay, I will stop there. <laughs>